Welcome to the Tabernacle Baptist Church. We're glad that you joined us this morning. We have ministries throughout the week uh, for you and your family, regardless of your age. If there's anything that we can do to assist you and your family, please feel free to contact us. Thanks for watching. Good morning and welcome. We're going to begin the service singing praises to the Lord. Let's stand together. the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. See 
pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you are sovereign over all creation. Lord, we thank you that you are solidly, firmly at the right hand of the Father, and that we know that nothing happens apart from your hand. Lord, we thank you for that assurance, and as we step in it, to our first week of worship in this new year, we thank you of that confidence and that assurance that we have that we are, we are your children, that nothing can pluck us out of your hand, and that no matter what happens this year, we know that you are large and in charge. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to read one of these. Um, it's usually associated, it's part of the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 2, but it's bigger than just the Christmas story. It reminds us of God's sovereignty over all of human history, even in the ugly stuff, even in the, the murders and the wars and the famines that God is sovereign. Starting in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. It said, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother married, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and says, Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, he t took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. I wanted to share a, a memory that I've got with this next song. We're going to sing Glorious Day. I was in uh, 10th grade and my friend was bringing us home from high school. And uh, my friend's dad was giving us a ride. And I just remember this isn't a normal thing, not this kind of guy, but this song's on the radio. And it's not like a normal social thing to do, I feel like, but he's just driving and just belting out this song while you know I'm sitting in the back and I just love this idea because I just could tell in that moment man was he just praising and just loved his God for loving him for dying for him for carrying his sins away it's just a beautiful thought that I have and I pray that that's our heart as we're singing this to our God would you guys stand and let's sing this together <laughs> praises one day when sin was as black as could be jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shined among us his glory revealed living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hands that heal nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails from me. Living, He loved me, dying, He saved me, buried, He carried my sins far away. Rise justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glory 
glorious day, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascending, my Lord, evermore. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising forward to the day when one day we will see you face to face, not someone we have to imagine or just read about, but we'll behold you face to face. And we look forward to that day we'll see our Savior. Amen. You guys may be seated. Is Kim around here? Kim. There we go. I had a memo. You were supposed to be up here, too. I am up here, too. I'm just letting you know. Okay. Up here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is Mission Sunday, everybody. So we want to recognize what um, we do here at the tab for missions. Um, we have a lot going on, always. It's good to be a part of the committee. But we want to also keep everybody here informed. So that's part of the reason that we do what we do on Mission Sunday is just to kind of keep you up to date on what's going on. So one of the things that we have going on is the missions trip to the Browns in March. And um, I don't know if we are on that one. It's not on this screen, so I was guessing. Thanks. Um, the missions trip to the Browns and that's in March. We would leave probably on the 9th because it would be a two-day travel. The working time would be from the 11th through the 15th, and then it'd be the two-day drive home. Um, so one of the things that they really want us to do is paint the house that they are living in on the outside. We do not have very many people on the team yet, and the ones that we have that have said that they could go, one of them I trust on a ladder. <laughs> so we are looking for some more able-bodied people that would be willing to serve in that way. Now we also do have a couple people that are tentative that like to do a lot of projects. And so they are thinking if they go, they are going to contact the maintenance crew there and see if there's anything that they do. Because a lot of times people, when we send out teams, don't realize what we're capable of here. We have a lot of farmers and a lot of people that like to do it yourself, so they are very talented and can get a lot done. 
So we do have some other projects that are a possibility as well. Sorry, I'm going a little bit long. But we really want to be able to do this for the Browns. They have never, in all the years that they have been in missions, had a church come with a team to serve them. So we really want to be able to do this for them. So if you have any questions and you need somebody to talk to, you can call me or grab me at church, OK? The other one we want to just bring to the forefront is Roy and Denise with their kids. Um, they were here to visit earlier this fall. They are back in Western Africa. So keep them in your prayers. I do believe they were able to take solar panels back with them so they have a little bit more trustworthy electric going on in their home for their ministry as well. So just keep them in, their prayer, in your prayers as well as they are back on ground in Africa. Thank you. I'm going to share about this conference. I want to first just take a second and just pray for the Browns and Roy and Denise. So would you guys join me in prayer? God, we want to pray for our missionaries, the Browns and um, the Thaggards, and I pray that you would encourage them, God, when they are feeling discouraged, that you'd help use us as a church to support them and to uplift them and just um, encourage them in their calling. And if that be mission trip types work, that you'd be about planning that and just helping that to, to go through in ways that are going to be just what the, what the missionaries need to continue on. We pray for them that you'd encourage them and use the, the coming months ahead for them. In your name, amen. Um, let's, we're going to talk about, this is a conference I just got back on and I'm probably a little sleep deprived from still, so <laughs> um, hopefully my words come out right. Uh, I got a few students who are going to share, you guys want to make your way up, uh, sharing for this conference. This is called Cross Conference, we just got back, it's a conference specifically for 18 to 25 year olds and high school seniors can tag along as well, so we brought some of them. Um, this took place, it was in Louisville, Kentucky, we were there for um, we left on Tuesday, and we just got back last night. Um, I'll, let, I'll let them share. It's, it's a mission-driven conference, talking about global missions around the world, but also um, talking about your local church. I'll, I, before I steal too much thunder about this conference, I'll let some of these sh students share what are some things that stuck out to them, some things that they pulled away from the conference that just come back and encourage you with. Wait, hold on. Would you also say your name yeah. when you... I'm Nick Wyatt. Um, what was really cool about this for me, um, they talked a lot about missions, but they talked about the senders and the goers. And so right now, we're all here, so we're obviously the senders. And so they talked about that, and um, about in one of the speakers said something that was encouraging, especially in some of our current ages where we are kind of in the flux of life without a long-term plan, and it's that the institution of the church is the one institution that God promises to grow, and so when you invest your life into the church, you uh, there's a guarantee that that's not going to be wasted. So that was just encouraging and cool. And then one of just the applications that I took away from this week, um, with missions, there's, um, there's a big need for prayer, and there's this app that one of the speakers showed a conference that's cool, and it's called, I think it's called Unreached People Group of the Day, and it just, um, yeah, it just shows you one of the unreached people groups, um, some statistics about them, how to pray for them, and so I've already started using that a little bit, but it's just cool because we know that people all across our country and the world are praying for those specific people that day, so, yeah. My name is Gunty Wyatt, and one thing really stuck out to me in CrossCon is if you are struggling with temptation, you can go to a pastor or a trusted friend to pray for you, to help you to get delivered out of sin, temptation. And one thing that applies to me in life in CrossCon is just reading your Bible every day and also meditating on God's Word, too. Thanks, 
My name is Olivia Skolton, and my biggest takeaway from the conference was just the importance of praising the Lord in all circumstances. Sometimes I just get so caught up in everything that's going on in my life, or just my life in general, that I forget that my life isn't even mine in the first place, but that it belongs to the Lord. And um, yeah, so I just was a great reminder of the importance of having a heart posture of rejoicing in every circumstance that I'm in in life. My name is Caitlin Nobles. Uh, something that I took away was something that I feel like I've taken for granted growing up in this church is how important a local church is, um, especially as I'm going off to college next year. I think a lot of people that have grown up in this church don't realize that if you don't have a strong local church, that can affect the rest of your, your life, your Christian life, and your walk in faith. And something I want to apply is just being a lot firmer when something does something I don't agree with and not letting them slide, like actually saying, hey, that's not right, you shouldn't do that, and just making sure that they know my faith. My name is Emily Doniker. Um, I think one thing that CrossCon taught me is it just focused on the role that in missions there's senders and there's goers. Um, and one thing we talked about was as senders in the local church, our job, one of our jobs is just to create an environment that really encourages missions and spreading the gospel throughout the, work, the world. Um, so I think that was cool just to think about how can we encourage even um, goers in our church if we are um, uh, senders. So. I'm going to, I'll say this just as a word of encouragement to you as you're thinking, oh, I'm not on the, the mission field. This is something that really stuck out to me was I was listening to missionaries, and it's really cool because, like, you have some sessions where they're like, this is the, turn off your phones, no social media, please, like, we're not even giving last names of these missionaries just because we, we can't, they're in, you know, dangerous places, and just hearing stories from people, and a couple missionaries just mentioned, you know, like, one thing that really, you know, they could have benefited from even more, and they just encouraged people in was people just in discipling them in their local church. They said, the local church is where mission starts from when you have just a growing local church and people discipling one another. You send people out from there. And they were saying, man, if I had someone disciple me in this way when I was still at my local church, that would have benefited me so much. If I had someone just really encourage me and teach me in my walk with Jesus to just grow so close to him in my local church, man, that would help me so much as I went out into missions. And so I want to encourage you that maybe you're not on the mission field, maybe you don't know who you're going to interact with who might be on the mission field one day, but with who God has put before you, are there people that you can disciple, that you can encourage, that you can pour into here in our church? So I want to pray for us as a congregation and just for people who are at this conference that uh, the Lord would continue to work. So let's pray. Your Father, we uh, pray for thousands of students who are at this conference contemplating missions in their own life and how they can be following what you do. Pray that you would continue the work that you started in students uh, across the country and around the world. Pray too for us as a, a local body that you would just call us further into discipleship and just the giving of ourselves to pouring into others and, um, and your mission here. So we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, you guys can grab. Would you give a hand to students for sharing? Before Holly gives us, uh, it's the first Sunday of the year, and so there's a whole bunch of slides that we're going to show you that you can be involved in, you can be praying with, but uh, just a special thank you to Pastor Ryan and to the church. People often say, man, what, what do the pastors do all week? And, you know, it's Christmas break. Let me just tell you a little bit. Uh, earlier, before last week, Ryan had a bunch of junior, he had Wednesday night and they had a bunch of junior hires over to play games. And then the, that weekend, he had all of the camp leadership that was here for a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, hosted kind of a camp thing. Then he got Monday off, but then he was back on the road, took 19 kids and two vans and all of the administration pressure that brings. And so um, I think you get tomorrow off, Ryan, right? We'll see. Well, super thankful for him and his leadership. Um, Holly, let us know how we can get plugged in here. 
I'm going to be sharing a number of announcements for the new year here. Um, for the month of January, we're doing 31 days of prayer, and this month is focused on a stand for the unborn. Um, so as a church, we're being very intentional about praying for this. Um, I invite you to sign up for a half-hour slot during the month of January to be intentional about the prayer for the unborn. Um, you can go to our church website, click on that little Learn More button. You can either sign up online, um, or Jessica will be at the table in the back of the uh, foyer after the service, and you can sign up on a sheet back there as well. Um, also online or at the back table, there is a two-page um, handout that kind of gives you idea of what to pray about and who to pray for and ways that we can pray for um, the church and for those that are dealing with this. Um, so go to the church website for more information or visit Jessica in the back. Our Wednesday night ministries are starting back up again. Um, Wednesday, January 10, the Awana Sheldon South will start at 6.30 and then our George North campus starts around 7 p.m. We also are starting a new Bible study series on Wednesday evenings, and this will be the Bible recap. This is going to start on Wednesday in the Fireside Room. Um, Debbie Cry is leading it, and I believe Roger Lamfers is also going to be assisting. Um, and this is a way to get through the Bible in 365 days, the whole Bible. Um, you can visit with Debbie at the table in the back if you have any questions. There is a green discussion book on the back table as well, if you would like to take one of those home. Um, that's a workbook you can do with this with this Bible study. And this is open to all people. So if you come on Wednesday night or you drop off the kids or you're picking up kids, um, it's not only for women, it's for men, it's for all ages. Um, so it's going to be a great mix of people, and they're going to meet in the fireside room on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. There is a specific women's um, Bible study happening on Wednesday afternoons at 1 p.m. They are doing the first Peter Bible study. Um, Robbie Jungers is leading this Bible study, and this one's not going to start until January 17, so it'll be next week. However, in order to order enough books, we'd like you to have it signed up by January 9. So let Robbie know if you have any questions on that. There is a men's Bible study that also takes place on Wednesday nights, and this will be at 7 p.m. in room 300. So we have a mix in the uh, fireside room for men, women, for the Bible recap. Women's Bible study is on Wednesday afternoons at 1. A specific men's Bible study is on Wednesday night, um, room 300, with Stan Corthels doing a study on Romans. And the annual meeting will be on Sunday, January 21 at 5 p.m. There's a soup and pie supper. Look at the bulletin to see if you're um, invited to bring soup or pie. And sample ballots are in everybody's church mailbox today. And there'll be more details coming on that in the week, in the coming weeks. And just as a reminder, Sunday school starts back up again today. After a few weeks of a break over the holidays, um, the two through four-year-olds meet at 9.45 following the service, go down to the basement for some song time. And then fifth grade and up, they start their Sunday school at 10 a.m. Hey, good morning, everybody. Looking forward to uh, our time together in the Word, uh, and it's been a delight to, to worship with you already today. So what we have going this morning is we have a calendric cultural climatological convergence and uh, that's why we're in Jeremiah 31 verse 15 and then jumping ahead to Matthew chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 with plenty of other verses I'm sure uh, thrown in for good measure. Why the calendric and uh, cultural and climatological convergence? Well uh, let, me, let me just say a few things about this. So You know, how many of you like the story of the wise men like I do? Yeah, it's a great story. In fact, it is so widely known that it has impacted uh, cultures, especially in the West, but beyond the West. So you may not know this, but yesterday was Epiphany Day. June, June. January 6th was Epiphany Day. And it's the celebration of the wise men coming and bringing gifts to Jesus. See? And so today is actually Epiphany Sunday. In Hispanic culture, and I asked my mom about this too because, of course, she's El Salvadoran, 
and she gave me all kinds of fun things that they've done in El Salvador and Guatemala, but uh, probably better known here in Northwest Iowa, more of the, uh, the Mexican uh, angle on this. We have the celebration of El Dia de los Reyes Magos, right? The celebration of the day of the three kings, the three wise kings. This is done in Mexican culture by eating this cake. It's the three kings cake, and in the cake is baked a little tiny uh, plastic figurine that represents Jesus, and whoever in the extended family gets that slice of the king's cake or bread needs to bring the tamales to, uh, to the Candlemas of February 2nd, which celebrates the presentation of Jesus to the temple and the purification of Mary. Okay? So this is, there's a cultural convergence. It's this weekend. There's a calendric convergence because we just celebrated Christmas and we're working our way through Jeremiah. So that's why I've jumped ahead. We'll go back, Lord willing, to Jeremiah 30. But today we're looking briefly at one verse in chapter 31. So then we can jump over to Matthew chapter 2. Okay? So, and, oh, what about the climatological convergence? Well, today we have snow on the ground. And we didn't have snow on the ground for Christmas. Okay? All right. Now you're ready? Here we go. So in Jeremiah chapter 30, 31, 32, and 33, we have a section of the book of Jeremiah called the Book of Comfort or the Scroll of Comfort. All right? And in this chapter, the context has to do with a future regathering, the return of the people of Israel, the people of Judah from the Babylonian captivity, and a restoration of fortune. And so it's looking ahead in the near term to the return of the people of Judah following the seven years of captivity in Babylon. And in the long term, it's looking forward to the great eschatological end of days regathering of the people of Israel into the promised land. And the chapter explains that there will be this future period of great exuberance and joy. And there will be a period of peace and prosperity there will be changes in the climate. It'll be favorable. There will be favorable changes for the agricultural economy of Israel. And the people of Israel in the future, in the end of days, they will express true worship to God. Okay? And this is all possible because of God's everlasting, never-ending love, because of his covenant faithfulness that he has expressed to his people Israel. And of course, we are also beneficiaries of that as members of the church. All right, so that's the context of Jeremiah 31. Uh, here it's nestled in this book of comfort, and that brings us then to verse 15, and I've thrown verse 16 in for good measure simply because verse 16 is a sampling of the rest of the entire chapter, which, again, Lord willing, we will study when we return to our series in Jeremiah. So here I am reading now from Jeremiah 31, verses 15 and 16. This is what the Lord says. A voice was heard in Ramah, a lament with bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And then verse 16, which is a summation of the entire chapter. This is what the Lord says. Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For the reward of your work will come. This is the Lord's declaration. And your children will return from the enemy's land. All right? So a couple of things about this verse or these two verses. First of all, Rachel. Many of you know who Rachel was. And uh, if not, you, should, you really should. You should jump back into the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and you should read about her. And I, if I'm understanding correctly, there are a number of us in the assembly who have... Uh, committed to reading through the Bible in the coming year, which is wonderful. So soon you'll be reading about Rachel. She was Jacob's second and favored wife. You can read about her in Genesis 29. She was the mother of Joseph and later of Benjamin. And of course, Joseph was the, was the father of Manasseh and Ephraim. So that means that Rachel was the grandmother of Manasseh and Ephraim. And because Rachel was the mother of Benjamin, um, that whole tribal allotment is associated with Rachel, okay? So I want you to think about that a little bit in this sermon. There's an artist's rendition of, of Rachel either with Joseph or with Benjamin. 
All right? Now, when Rachel was giving birth to Benjamin, she had a, had a problematic delivery, and she knew she was dying, and so she wanted to call him son of my um, sorrow, Benoni. And, of course, Jacob called him Binyamin, son of my right hand. And she died while they were approaching Ephrata, which is um, another name, a very ancient name for Bethlehem. Bethlehem, okay? And as a result of that, the Muslims, they erected a memorial site for the burial of Rachel. And uh, Jewish people today have refurbished that and so forth. And it is a... It is a um, a destination for women in Israel who are trying to conceive and have been unable to conceive. I'm not going to go into all the details. Very interesting. Uh, you would have to pay tuition for that, and we could meet, and I could go through all of that with you, or maybe go on one of my tours or whatnot, okay? But uh, what's odd about this, maybe, is that in the verse that I first read, verse 15, it says, Rachel weeping for her children, but the, the place referent is Ramah. Okay, so why Rama? Well, the reason why it's Rama uh, is because Rama was the, was the staging ground, it was the deportation center for the people of Judah after the Babylonian burning of Jerusalem, which you see artistically represented on the slide here in 586 BC. So the captain of, the, of King Nebuchadnezzar's guard, his name was Nebuzaradan, he was sending refugees and deportees up just five, six, well, four, five, six miles north of Jerusalem to a place called Ramah in the tribe of Benjamin. And from there, they would be sent over to Babylonia. Now, I know about this because it's recorded in Jeremiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, which, Lord willing, one day we'll get there. All right, so Ramah was the place where the refugees went in 586. And now I'm going to go and reread this verse again. A voice was heard in Rama, a lament with bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they are no more. So when Jeremiah writes that bit of poetry, he is selecting Rachel as the mourning, weeping mother who represents all the mothers of Judah, and before her, all the mothers of Israel, because the ten northern tribes, they went into captivity in 722 B.C. under the Assyrians. And so Rachel becomes an archetype of the weeping, mourning mother, the mother who loses her child, in this instance, through exile, most particularly in the 586 exile, leaving out of Ramah. Okay, you all still with me so far? This is the hard stuff. Then we get to the kings or the magi or the wise men. It's, I think it's more familiar. But it's important that we study this verse today, and you'll see why in just a second. And then, of course, that weeping will turn to, to rejoicing in verse 16, okay? Now, because Rachel died as she was approaching Bethlehem, we're going to see her name again later in the sermon, and we'll see it in Matthew chapter 2, all right? And I want to show you a map here I, I took and, and blew up like an inset to show you more closely. So you see how that David selected Jerusalem as his capital because it was right between the, the northern area and the southern area, and he could rule both north and south uh, powerfully. And five miles north of Jerusalem is Ramah, which is different, by the way, from the hometown of Samuel the prophet. He's, he's from a different Ramah in Ephraim. But the Ramah in Benjamin is the Ramah mentioned in Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 15. And you'll see then how that Bethlehem is four, five miles south of Jerusalem. Do you see that on the map? So you see how Ramah's to the north, and about the same distance that Ramah is to the north of Jerusalem, Bethlehem is located to the south of Jerusalem. You still with me? And now you know that when they vacated many thousands of people from Jerusalem and prepared them to de for deportation. They sent them north to Ramah, and that's why mothers were separated from children and why they are weeping. 
See, and that's why Rachel, who was one of the four mothers of the people of Israel, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, they are called our four mothers within Judaism. Rachel becomes the archetype then for the mother who loses her, her child. This is a picture here of the, the, it's the purported burial site of Rachel. It's out, located right outside of Bethlehem, modern day Bethlehem. It says on the, the, the doorway there, it says the, the grave of Rachel, our mother which is interesting. The grave of Rachel, our mother. And I did not take the next picture. I would not have been allowed in. Uh, I don't think. I haven't ever tried. Maybe I should try. And then you'll read about me in the newspaper. Um, so here are two very observant Jewish women, and they're praying. And uh, they're either praying because they've lost a child, or they want a child, or they're praying for a daughter, maybe, who's having a uh, troublesome pregnancy. And you can see how this all fits together. And I mean, it's so, it fits like this so well because it's just been going on for centuries. All right, so this, this is why this is a contested area. And Bethlehem is Palestinian, but this is a, a ritual site right here, okay? Okay, so with that in mind, uh, now we jump ahead to Matthew chapter 2. And in Matthew chapter 2, we read, of course, about the wise men, and pastor has already read about them. And... It's such a familiar story that I won't go through it verse by verse with you, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 2, because I'm really trying to get down to verses 16, 17, and 18. But you know as well as I do how that the wise men, they're not called kings, that's a later tradition, and they're not given a number. And, of course, in popular culture, they're numbered three, and that's probably because of the three gifts. And what are the three gifts? Gold. Good. So now we're back in familiar territory here in Matthew chapter 2. And uh, because of the three gifts, that's why there are the three wise men or the three kings. But probably they traveled with a much larger uh, entourage. They'd have to have servants and guards and, and so forth. And this is an, this is an old uh, representation of the wise men. And notice that they're three in number. It's from Ravenna in Italy, but it's in the 500s, so it's Byzantine art. It's Constantinople's art being spread over to Italy. And notice that it, they are dressed in breeches. If you're a classical scholar, you see that right away. And they have Phrygian hats, which is, is the Byzantine way of trying to depict Persians who in the Roman period are called Parthians, which in your newspaper are called Iranians because the arch enemy of the Romans was almost always, I know you think the barbarians in the north because you're trying to give yourself credit as Dutch and Germans, but uh, they, they had a tough time with the barbarians, yes, but they had a really tough time with the Parthians. Whole legions were wiped out by the Parthians. And there was this power struggle, and that'll come into play here in the sermon in just a little bit. Okay, so you remember all this now? They came from the east, wise men from the east. We have seen his star. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? And they showed up in Jerusalem, and all the city was troubled, and King Herod especially. All right? So they traveled. They traveled maybe eight, 900 miles, and uh, that, if they averaged about 20 miles a day, that would have taken about 40 days. So they were not there at the manger. And in fact, the text itself says that, that later on when they arrived to give their gifts, that uh, the Christ child, Jesus, our Savior, that he and Mary, his mother, and Joseph, that they were in a house, all right, because Joseph was a skilled laborer and a community college graduate, so he could get a job anywhere. And, uh, and right away, I mean, he realized, I've got to set up my family, and so whatever the business was, he set it up, and he's already working, and they're already in a, in a rented home or whatever. Okay, and so they received the gifts. But I'm getting ahead of myself because um, when they, these wise men arrived in Jerusalem and they asked the question, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And all Jerusalem was troubled, and Herod especially. Uh, Herod asked the, the Jewish scribes, the priest types, to search the Old Testament, we call Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, to find out the prophecy, where would the... Now notice... Born king of the Jews, where would the Christ be born? And so already there's this realization that Messiah king is one and the same, and he is. 
And so they, they're like, well, that's not hard. And they walk over and they pull off uh, from the scroll shelf and they unroll it to what you and I call chapter 5 and verse uh, 2 of Micah, right? And they read, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. And so they're saying that the future great king, the Messiah, the anointed one, the, the, the one who will fulfill these prophecies, he will be born just five miles south of here in Bethlehem. And you know the story how Herod said to the wise men, okay, very good, I want you to go down and you'll find where this uh, baby is. And then when you find out where the baby is, I want you to come back here to Jerusalem, just five miles, and I want you to tell me where he is because I want to go and worship him too. Because he wanted to kill Jesus, right? King Herod wanted to kill baby Jesus. That's why he, he wanted to find out where Jesus was. He couldn't go himself for the five miles, right? And here's a map of Herod's domain. Herod was a mighty ruler who extended the, the realm of, of the Jewish nation back to its Davidic Solomonic kind of scale. And he was a, a building, uh, I don't know, like a master builder. And he built all kinds of fortresses, even pagan temples throughout the Roman Empire. And his, his, the, the greatest accomplishment was the Jerusalem temple. The temple of Ezra was refurbished, uh, beginning in his reign and for many decades of work. And so the temple in, in Jerusalem was spectacular. Okay? He was really good at collecting taxes. And that's why the Romans liked him. In fact, he was so good, there were some years where he said, I will cut taxes by a fourth. He did this for the Jewish people on more than one occasion, which is why he gets mixed reviews. He even paid the bills of other client kings who were unable to collect taxes like he could. But he did it because he was so ruthless. All right? Now, uh, I don't want to get into too much history, but it's important for the text, and you've probably heard this before, and so if you've heard it before, it's just a nice review. Sometimes we say that Herod uh, began his reign in year XYZ, or year 37 BC, and that it ended in 4 BC, and why is it that we're not sure when he began his reign? It's because he first was a sub-ruler under the last Jewish king named uh, Hyrcanus II. And when there was a revolt under that fellow, which was perpetrated by the Parthians, Herod, who was supposed to be supporting Hyrcanus, ran to Rome. Well, because he had to. His life was in danger. He was supportive of the Roman selection for Jewish king. He ran to Rome. And he was going to the Senate, begging the Senate for Roman military support to prop up Hyrcanus II, this last Jewish king. And surprise of all surprises, Mark Antony and the rest of the Senate said, well, we'll just make you king of the Jews. He's like, huh, all right. He was surprised. But he knew he had no kingdom. And so he said, well, I'm going to need some legions. And they said, don't worry, we'll get you those. And so it took several years for Herod to conquer Judea and Samaria and the Galilee and Perea and so forth. And he captured Jerusalem, and he was never born king of the Jews. He was made king of the Jews by the Roman Senate and took it by force. And he was always worried if they would ever receive him, therefore, as king. That's why he built so many things. He kept trying to curry their favor. That's why he killed his, some of his sons and more than one of his wives. And that's why, reportedly, as Pastor said a few weeks ago, Caesar Augustus, said when he gave him permission, yes, you can kill some more of your family. Uh, it, it's safer to be uh, a sow than a son in Herod's household because as a practicing Jew, he wouldn't have eaten pork. But he didn't have any problems killing his boys, okay? So he, there's, a, there's a coin, and it says in Greek, King Herod, Basileus Hrodu. And there's his sarcophagus, that is his burial box, which was uncovered uh, in one of his fortresses, the Herodium, which is just outside of Bethlehem. You can see it from Bethlehem. So interesting. All right, so the wise men, they go south from Jerusalem, and they show up, and they give their three gifts of what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which paid for the getaway trip. 
for the baby Jesus and for Mary, his mother, and for Joseph, his stepfather. And then being warned by God in a dream, they chose not to go back through Jerusalem and to tell Herod where the baby Jesus was. This is probably a better artistic representation of how that scene looked. In a house, more than three, and giving the gifts there in Bethlehem. And Jesus is a young toddler, two years or younger, because of the time that the star appeared to the wise men and being warned of God in a dream, those, the wise men, however many there were, they went back the other way, which might have taken them back, by the way, through Petra, which is interesting. And in Eastern Orthodoxy, they believe the wise men came through and back through Petra. So then Joseph was warned by God, and he took Mary and Jesus, and they went to Egypt, as you know, right? They fled to Egypt. That would be more like 90 miles Here's some more artistic representation. Every time I go to Egypt, I think about the fact that my Savior was here as a toddler. Yeah. Just like Abraham was, and Joseph, and Jeremiah was in Egypt. And that's another artistic representation. So interesting. All right, that brings us to our last two verses. And then I'll wrap it up. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage, no surprise there, he gave orders to massacre all the male children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, which scholars say could have ranged anywhere from 10 to 40, likely, given upon population numbers. And in keeping with the time that he learned from the wise men, remember, two or younger, all those baby and infant and toddler boys are put to death, who are still back in Bethlehem. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, that's why we're here today, was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they were no more. So what happens here is that Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, you know, listen very carefully, to, especially if you're aspiring theologians, because this is a difficult text, and I'm going to try and say it in just a few sentences, and I can move on to application, because I have four more minutes. But if this were a seminary class, this is where we'd have to spend our time. <laughs> but I want to give you food to live the Christian life. But I'm going to also treat you to the, the hermeneutical discussion here. The point is that when Jeremiah wrote this, he was writing a prophecy for the immediate future. Because the people of Judah were being deported out of Ramah in 586 B.C. You follow what I'm saying? So when Matthew takes this and he says, when Jeremiah wrote that, here we have its ultimate fulfillment. The idea is not fulfilled in the sense like Micah 5.2 was fulfilled. That's a literal fulfillment referring to Jesus. Jesus born in Bethlehem. But it is a Filling full, and that is allowed in the Greek word, a filling full kind of connection to the text, like Hosea, uh, out of Egypt have I called my son. When Hosea is not referring to the Messiah, but to Israel and the Exodus, and it's applied to Jesus, similarly, Jeremiah's prediction of the deportation and of a mother, all the mothers weeping because Rachel is the archetype, it finds its fullness in Rachel representing all those poor Jewish mothers who are weeping over the loss of their, their baby boys at the birth of Jesus. She's an archetype, okay, and finds its fullness at this time. Rachel weeping for her children. Wow, look at that. There's a, there's a slide that shows, and if you had the close-up on King Herod, it's pretty nice because his face is a little bit eaten away, and he's really sick and angry, and that's because he's within days, weeks, at the most months of dying. And according to Josephus, Herod, who died in Jericho, died of loathsome, disgusting diseases. Poor guy. Well, just desserts, I guess, in this life. Who knows what happens in, oh, we know what happens in the life to come. And so here's another rendition. Rachel weeping for her children and trying to kill Jesus within a few days or weeks. Herod himself is dead and he's buried in the Herodium. And Joseph and Mary return 
to Bethlehem, and then they're warned, or give, they have good advice, actually. Don't stay around here because Herod's son, he's a monster, so go on up north to Galilee, to Nazareth. And that takes us to the end of chapter 2 of Matthew. So no time to explain. We've got to go. And so they went up to Nazareth, and he, he uh, kept working up there, Joseph did, and providing for his little family. So we love the story of the wise men, don't we? And when we wrap this up, this is the last slide. I took this picture this fall, and uh, I took it because I thought, I'm going to preach on the wise men someday, and here we are today. In the shadow of the wise men, what do we take away? Herod was never born king of the Jews. He tried to kill the real one who was born king of the Jews. Herod ended up dying a horrible death. Jesus didn't die at that time because God the Father was with him. Jesus kept living, lived a perfect life, never deserved death. When he died, he died lovingly and willingly on a cross. And then three days later, he came back powerfully from the dead, never to die again. That's Jesus, right? Rachel, the embodiment of every Jewish mother, in a sense today, is the embodiment of every mother. And I know that it's a special month, calendrically, in our church and throughout uh, Bible-believing America. Uh, there, there was a total disregard for human life in the Herodian administration. And Bible Christians, those who love the Prince of Life, would have a completely different view of life, whether in utero or postpartum, right? And the kingdom of heaven has been facing violence since the days of John the baptizer up until now, Jesus said, and some are trying to seize it by force. But for those of us who have received Jesus by faith and we've taken him up on his offer for eternal life, this one, Jesus, becomes our God-given wisdom. He's our righteousness. He's our sanctification. He's our redemption. The wise men came to worship him, but it was Jesus who is the embodiment of wisdom. They may have been kings, probably not, but Jesus certainly is the king, not only the king of the Jews, but he's the king of all kings. And I would encourage you and me in the coming year to believe in him, to worship him, to serve him, and to make sacrifice for him in the year to come. Would you rejoice with me? Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for this opportunity to be mindful of how special he is, even now seated at your right hand. And Father, we pray that you would continue to draw people onto him, and by faith they would look to him for salvation. Thank you, Father, for his royalty. Thank you for the fulfillments of these prophecies. Thank you for your protection over him. And in this broken world in which we live, where there is death on every side, back in, in the Bible days and, and on up through to today, Father, we pray that as, as your people, we would speak truth and love and life to those who are around us. We ask this so that Jesus, our Savior, the Prince of Peace, and the King of Kings would be greatly magnified. And we do look forward to seeing him, even as the wise men did, and to see him face to face. Hasten that day, Father. May we be ready for it, for we ask it in his name, our Savior and King. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and close together in song.
sins far away Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day Oh glorious day Glorious day One day the trumpet will sound with his glories will shine wonderful day my beloved one's bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Don't forget as you leave, uh, we've got lots of opportunities to get plugged in and signed up. Have a great start to your new year. God bless you. And uh, I'll be up front here for a little bit. Uh, elders will be back in the prayer closet if you want someone to pray over you, for you, encourage you. Thank you. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>